Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our members of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position, along with your favorite beverage, to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine the show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Ryan S., Nick W., Holly W., and Todd A. New guest on the program today, Mr. Neil Woodyear has joined us. Neil is the Chief Executive Officer of Aris Gold, a gold project developer advancing the Lower Marmato Mine development in Colombia with an aim of growing to a mid-tier producer status. The company also has an exploration project in Ontario, Canada. The company is listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the symbol ARIS and also on the US OTC markets under the symbol ALLXF. Mr. Woodgear, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Well, Neil, I understand you're talking to us uh, from somewhere in Central Europe. Where are you? Uh, I'm in the south of France at the moment. Excellent. I got stuck. <laughs> well, good to have you on. Good to finally chat. It's, it's really good to have you on the show. Finally, we've been trying for some time to get you on all the way back to the legal days. Well, Neil, you've been <laughs> in this business for a long time. Tell the audience where you think we are in this gold price cycle as compared to prior cycles you've experienced. As you say, I've been around the industry for a long time. I've seen a number of cycles. I think this is solid. I think it carries on for some considerable time. And I, I think it, it does that. Uh, not so much supply and demand, although I think that will come back. I think it does that simply because of the world economic state. The governments are not able to manage the problems ahead of them, and they're not able to manage what they've gone through. Debt is accumulating. People need more jobs. They need more input into the economy. That's only going to lead ultimately to inflation. It's going to lead people to be concerned about currencies. It's a very, very strong time for gold going forward. Neil, how about your experience? Maybe just touch on that for our audience who may not know of you. Why don't you just cover your past experience, give us a few highlights, and why you took the lead role at RS Gold? Okay. I started, as a lot of people did, as a chartered accountant, and then went into metal trading and ran a metal trading company in New York with subsidiaries in Latin America, uh, buying and selling uh, most metals from mines and selling them to refiners, that sort of thing. I then went to a bank and ran their commodity project and project finance and commodity business. And I then started about 30 years ago, a company called Endeavor Financial, a financial advisor business for mining companies in Vancouver. And we arranged project finance for a number of uh, companies then, and we, we helped people create mining companies. In 2008, we were a, uh, uh, a merchant bank. We had, um, about 300 million under management. Most of it invested our clients. The market turned. We lost a lot of money because uh, our clients' businesses went down with the market and we couldn't sell. So we said, not a good business. And we had, as I say, created many mining companies. So we decided to do it our own. And we took some of the money that we had. And then we started a company called, we changed Endeavor Financial into Endeavor Mining. We bought a small mine in West Africa. And then over the next uh, five, six years, we acquired, uh, we did about three, five or six other M&A transactions. Uh, we acquired five mines. We, we built two mines. We took two projects to feasibility. We brought in a strategic investor. And at that time, it was appropriate for management to move on. So management did move on. Uh, I retired. Three days later, my uh, partner, Frank Juster, who I'd worked with over many years, suggested we do it again. And we started Lear Gold uh, in 2000, I think it was 2016. Uh, and we, we bought uh, into Los Filos. We bought Los Filos in Mexico. We then bought four or five, three mines uh, in, in uh, Brazil and one project which was about to start construction. And we stopped that construction to be checked it out and we started again and we expanded our Mexican company, uh, at double the reserves at Los Filos, and then merged that about a year ago with Equinox. And I retired yet again. And yet again, we decided to do it again at Aris. And Aris actually means again in Celtic. And, and I have with me uh, a large number of the management team that were with me in Endeavor. 
who also went through to Lear Gold and are now with us again uh, at Harris, both on the operating side and the financial side. This time, we, we got a lot of support from some industry senior players. Uh, uh, Ian Telfer is our chairman, and of course, he started Wheaton River and became chairman of Goldcorp. David Garofalo was chief executive of Goldcorp. Uh, Peter Maroney started Umana in uh, 2003. Uh, and Fino Yakino is, is on the board because of our connections with, with the Colombian operation. So we have a very strong entrepreneurial board of, of people who have built mining companies themselves over a period of time. So our objective is take the management team that we've used and knows each other well, take our ability to raise money, take our direct contact base intelligence uh, knowledge and put it together and build another intermediate mining company. That's well, what we're doing. Neil, I appreciate that. You, uh, you hit everything on the head there, including some of the team. I was going to ask about them. You covered that. Appreciate the clarification. Eris, Celtic, again, excellent. Appreciate that. Neil, maybe just touch on the capital structure here real quick. How many shares are out at this point? Maybe you can just briefly cover the major shareholders on the roster. And what is the cash debt situation? The company capital structure was put together by uh, Grand Columbia. They spun uh, a company, Caldas, out just about a year ago. And uh, Grand Columbia had discovered the lower mine uh, at Mamato. They did last year, they did a fantastic job. They, they not only discovered it, they did a feasibility study on it, a pre feasibility study on it. They also were able to get a 30 year mine life extension. They also raised about 250 million uh, of, of equity, uh, and also included in that was, was a gold stream from Wheaton River. So they raised about 200 million in total. But they needed about 250, 260 to do the project. So we came along, uh, our group, and said, okay, we'll arrange the extra 85 million Canadian that you need to finish off the financing. And then, you know, the agreement is that we've got the team to take over the management to develop the project. So that's exactly what we did. So we brought $85 million in. Our team put in about 35 of that together. Uh, so we invested our own cash uh, into the deal. And we took over the company in February. The company has about nearly 200 million of cash. We are due another 70 million on a progress basis from uh, Wheaton Precious Metals. So we have all the cash that we need to build this mine, about $260 million. So we're, we're well financed. Uh, we, we do have some, um, the, the Wheaton stream at 110 in total. Uh, we also have some uh, gold notes and the rest is, is straightforward equity. And Neil, how many shares of ours do you own here? And uh, if you don't mind sharing, what price do you own them? I'm not quite sure how many shares I own. I put 10 million US dollars into the 85 million Canadian. Perfect. Well, that gives us a good starting point so, there. I appreciate that. And as far as I'm concerned, it's also my largest investment and therefore it's going to work. <laughs> I am totally aligned with, I am totally aligned, uh, with the shareholders. And well, our, that's good. Our, our, team, our team put 35 million Canadian in. And I put at that 10 million mine, uh, the US of that was mine. So our team is very committed. Our managers are committed and our directors are committed. That's good for shareholders to hear. And of course, uh, yeah. uh, getting this project, the work, the relationships, you know, this project, naysayers or otherwise, it's all about who you know in this business to be able to get these deals done. And you guys are now going to take this with your team and build this out. There's no doubt in my mind that this uh, will happen over time here. So good on you. looks like you have a lot of the cash here to, to be able to execute on that and also other stuff, which I want to discuss in a moment. But uh, right. Neil, for a moment, talk about the uh, the next steps here on the lower mine development and just highlight the pre-feasibility study. Uh, okay. I, I, think, I think the important thing at the moment is we have a small historic mine which produces about 25,000 ounces at a very high oil and sustaining cost because it's a very narrow main, lots of working surface, and, and a lot of people are running around the hillside. What we're doing at the moment is, is doing much better mine planning, improving the mine planning, 3D modeling. We're also changing some of the mining style, and we're certainly changing the, the levels of workforce. So that's going on. At the same time, we're doing all the planning and starting to do the implementation work for the, for the lower mine. We entered into an EPCM contract about a month ago. Uh, so that's in hand. We've had our first kickoff meetings underground. 
for the underground, uh, and we're now moving ahead with that. Uh, so I say we have a 30-year extension on the mine license, so plenty ahead of us. The, the other important thing that we're doing is a follow-on that Grand Columbia started, and we're picking it up. They started a 35,000-meter 35, uh, 35, drill program uh, about a year ago, uh, and it's about 70% of the way through. It is showing uh, very good results, some of which have been released. So we would expect to finish that in the next uh, few months uh, and be able to come out with, with, with hopefully, hopefully we don't know, but hopefully an increased resource uh, so that we can extend the mine life from 13 years beyond the 13 years we already have, and perhaps there's some higher grade material which can improve the mine plan in the meantime. So those are the things that are going on uh, underground. We've also replaced the management team at the mine and brought in people that we work with, the uh, General manager now, uh, we work with in West Africa, we work with him in uh, Mexico. The sort of senior vice president of operations who will be in charge of the construction and the uh, operations as well. Uh, he again worked with us. He ran our Mali mine with Endeavor. Uh, he ran Los Filos for, for Leo Gold, uh, and he's now down. They're both now living in uh, Colombia, uh, doing what they have to do, getting things the way we want them, uh, and taking the thing forward. Neil, on the CapEx, What's the plan here? Because mm -hmm. you've got this large cash balance to handle really the majority of that CapEx, if not all of it here, pretty easily at this point. But also you yep. guys are looking towards M&A. So what's the plan right. here with that cash? And then I want you to talk about your M&A strategy. The, the cash is, is primarily dedicated to doing the lower mine. When, when the lower mine is done, we will be for the first few years in excess of 200,000 ounces and we will be around about 900 uh, all in sustaining cost. That is priority one to get that done. The cash is there, the team is there, so get on with it. It's a two-year job, just over two years job, they're underway. Okay, so that's where the cash is sort of earmarked for. In the meantime, and what we've always done in the past is made sure that our operating team operated and our corporate team kept the fingers out on the pie. We, we, we allow, uh, we, we establish uh, plans uh, and objectives with the operating team. We give them authority and responsibility and we monitor what goes on and correct anything that's not going. But we do not interfere into the day-to-day -day operations, which means the unit becomes its own business center, becomes its own profit center. It thinks about its own cash flow. It thinks about its own costs. The corporate team, which we keep small, uh, is there to, to uh, say, monitor what's going on, but it's also there to look at other operations uh, and, and how we can develop the overall company either through M&A or, or, or through helping to finance uh, other projects. So we've now got the operations established. As I say, we, we took over the management of the company in February. We've now got the operations established, going down the track we wanted to go down. We've now got the development of the lower mine going the way we wanted to go. So now the thought is moving to are there other transactions that we can bring about that can add to the mass of the company, to add to the portfolio and to the value of the company for shareholders. So M&A is, is the next topic on our agenda. Let me talk just a little bit more about that, mergers and acquisitions. The market is still of select value in my view, Neil, as I suspect you share my view on the value proposition here in the market that still exists. Your thoughts on the types of M&A transactions Eris is looking for, what type of project profile, and if you could, please share some jurisdictions that you would like to see, Neil. Okay, well, th th uh, having been involved in the M&A business, the mining business, for well, more years than I can care to recall, actually, I, I, I do know that what looks like a deal today very often isn't a deal tomorrow. The market changes, situations change. So it's very difficult to keep your tabs on things. And, and, and you have to be able to move quickly when an opportunity comes. You have to be able to assess it and you have to be able to take decisions. And that's why we structure ourselves in the way that we do. So we look at the market at the moment, and, and Latin America, we think, will provide and does provide a fair number of opportunities. You've got single mine companies, and it's very expensive running a single mine company. If, if you're running a public company with a single mine, your overhead cost, corporate overhead cost, is anything from 8 to $15 million, depending how you do it. That's an awful lot of money riding on the back of one small and medium-sized mine. So if you can consolidate these things, you do save a lot of money that way. But, but, but the object of consolidation isn't to save money in that overhead. The object is to create a, a portfolio of viable assets and an ever-increasing value and an ever-increasing quality of those assets. And this is where we need to go. 
So we, we, we look therefore for assets that we can acquire. We, we look either at a single company that we could do a deal with, or, or maybe a, a, a non-core asset, as Los Filos was to go. Los Filos was a non-core asset, it was 200,000 ounces, but now building to 400,000 ounces. So if you can buy something from a senior, that's another way of doing it. So we do think Latin America offers a lot of opportunities. It's always difficult to know what they are because, to, as I say, today's won't be the same ones in six months' time. But they come and they go. You just have to be able to identify, analyze, and negotiate, and importantly, finance them. And, and that's something that we've been able to do over the years, bring bank finance in and bring equity finance in and other kinds of finance because that was the background to the company that we started, or I started 30 years ago, helping uh, mining companies raise money. So jurisdictions, Latin America, I would love to go back to Mexico. We had a very, very good experience in Mexico uh, with Los Filos, a lot of support from, from the region, a lot of support from, from the Ministry of Mines. Uh, I think we've got a similar thing in Brazil. Uh, we're, we're getting that in Colombia. So we look for those countries that do that. I, I think that sort of Argentina is interesting in many ways. I would love to be in Venezuela. The potential of Venezuela from a mining point of view gold is terrific. It's a little bit difficult politically at the moment. So that's one we'll put out there to, to perhaps look at in the future. A little bit in Central America possible too. So number of opportunities, but, but, but I would certainly like to get back to Mexico if that's at all possible. I, I liked Brazil. Uh, Central America, yes. Neil, your expertise is appreciated, and uh, there's a lot of wisdom that you can share. Uh, hopefully, we can continue to talk more on a different program. I definitely think that the region is very fruitful, whether you look at an Ecuador right now, whether you look at a Nicaragua, mm -hmm. even mm -hmm. Chile in some places, uh, interesting stuff happening there as well. So there's good stuff there. And then also, I want to go back to another point you made about the operating team being independent of the corporate team. I think that that is a very smart move. And again, I appreciate you sharing some insights on how you view and how you manage this. I think it's uh, good to point out. Let's move to environmental social governance. Now, yep. a lot of people ask about ESG, and uh, it irritates me to some degree just to state that people who ask about ESG, most of them don't understand the blood, sweat, tears, and stress that goes into ESG. But what is your view of ESG, Neil? And is it anything new to you? Emphasis new, concepts are not new. Uh, e ESG is, is, is something that investors uh, have picked up on relatively recently. And I think we will see a much stronger uh, ESG investor requirement and profile going forward, which is not a bad thing. But if you look at the industry, the industry has actually, most of the industry, has actually had a very, very good uh, implementation of various types of ESG, not necessarily called ESG, over the years. We, we, the industry has been good on community relations, developing communities, helping communities economically. Uh, it's been good in terms of the, the environmental movements that have been made. A lot has been going on that people don't see and don't understand. Uh, also working with the various governments on the mining code to make sure the mining code is a fair, fair distribution of wealth between the country that actually owns the asset in the first place and the mining company that's trying to develop the asset and making sure they, that money is given back. I know that in, in, when we were in West Africa, this was always an important topic about how to structure a deal so that the government and community felt they were getting their fair share out of it. At the same time, we could mine it within, in, in a reasonable uh, and economic way. A lot of the, the, the laws that have come about in the last 20 years from the government have allowed uh, much better exploration, much better development. But I do think the industry has been very good. It's had a bad rep. It hasn't explained what it's been doing as well as it should do. I think ESG is a good opportunity for us to explain what we have been doing. Some bad things have happened, always do, but, but the industry in total has been very good at this area. So I, I think it looks forward to this ESG move quite strongly. And your team, of course, is no stranger to it, uh, going back to CSR and prior reiterations. This has been going on for decades. Yeah. But uh, with Eris, is there anything specifically at this point in time? I know you guys are early stage, but is there anything at this point in time specifically on the community side, which is what I like to highlight, anything you guys are doing specifically in the community uh, surrounding Marmont? Well, I, I think I have to give a lot of credit to Grand Columbia. And, and we, sorry, you, you asked me a question before, which I didn't answer, which is our principal shareholders. 
uh, because of the way the company was spun out of Grand Columbia, and then we took over the management of it, Grand Columbia is a 40% shareholder of Aris. And we have a, a deal with them whereby they will vote with management for the next few years and they won't sell the stock for the next few years. So it's a very friendly relationship. We go back a long way with people at Grand Columbia. They, they did, as I said, a very good job operationally, but, but also the 30-year the, the uh, mine license extension. You don't get a 30-year mine license extension unless you have the right attitudes, the right relationships, and know how to work with the community. And they did a very, very good job at, at that over Mamat over a period of time, the way they have done in Segovia as well, their other mine in Colombia. And we are riding along with that uh, and trying to see what additional things we can do uh, to help with the community and also to make sure that we provide local employment to the community. Historically, a large a workforce, large portion of the workforce in Mamato has been sort of bust in. Well, we're trying to bring in the local community much more because it's, it's, it's their asset, it's their community, it's, it's their economic future as well that we can assist to it. So these things have been very important to us. So I think we are changing the emphasis at Mamata to, 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 to look at the local employment situation much more strongly than we've done in the past. But we are coming off a very strong uh, support with the community and politically that, that Grand Columbia were able to implement. So that's very good. And we've kept their team. Uh, their team has joined our team and that, that, that's excellent. So we, we bring in our thinking plus the local know-how and, and that's what makes it work community component of ESG to me is, is one of the yeah. most important pieces of that and yeah. uh, you know what the community wants and, and so forth and as you guys ramp up here and, and become a cash flowing company that's obviously going to get better for the community. Um, let's move to Ontario Canada. Juby project, what is the plan for this project? Will it get advanced by you or is it a non-core monetization asset? Honest answer, we don't know but we're going to find out. If you look at the Juby project, it's in a fantastic location. It's got some great neighbors. It should be a good gold mine, but, but we don't know. The work that's been done, there's been no drilling for about three, three or four years. Uh, the work that was done seems to be solid. Uh, the people who put the study together uh, two or three years ago suggested the next phase of exploration, uh, and we've, we've, stuck, we've, we've taken their uh, recommendations. Uh, and we have started that phase. Of so we started a, a drill program of about uh, 10,000 meters, three or four million dollars. And we started that now uh, and we will see what that turns up. Uh, we would expect to put more money into it. We would expect to continue with the results and we expect to get the results and move forward. Ultimately, whether we get to a situation where we have a reasonable uh, size uh, reserve, uh, would we build it? Would we sell it? We, we, we claim to be company builders. Who, who not only buy companies and mines, but also build companies and mines. So I would imagine we would build it, unless you consider the Canadian political risk too much. Maybe I shouldn't joke about that. I am a Canadian as well. So, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it's, um, it, it's open. We, we will do whatever it gives us the shareholder value. We, we have no strong view other than if it's a good asset and we can enhance it for shareholders, we will do so. If it's right for us to build it, we will build it. Understood. I appreciate that. Longer term strategy here, Neil, Endeavor Mining was a yep. six year venture for you with the company continuing as a large Africa focused operator today. Lee Gold was yep. a merger after four years with a focus on Central South America. Same model with Eris here. And are you planning to beat the last time frame, which was four years with Lee Gold? <laughs> okay, well, let me, let me try and answer the first one first in, in terms of uh, same model, essentially the same model. Uh, when we, my, my history was, was working in Latin America, trading in Latin America. When we did the advisory business out of Canada, most of that was, it was, was Latin America. If you look at our board, Telsa's expertise is Latin America. Yamana's, Peter Moroni's expertise, David Groffler, very strong Latin American expertise. So if you put that together with, with the market in Latin America, the emphasis has to be Latin America. We're not going to rush off somewhere else. We're going to stick with what we know because we think there are opportunities. So yeah, Latin America. Uh, me, I'm good for a few years. I really enjoy what I do. I, I get support from my family for what I do. Um, I've invested significantly in it from my, my perspective. So I will take it to the next level, be it two years, three years, four years, whatever it is. Uh, I will take it to its next level where we've created that company. I, mean, I, I am not a good person to manage a, a mature business where administration, 
becomes important where procedures and committees, I mean, I hate committees. Uh, we are much more entrepreneurial. When it becomes less entrepreneurial, I should not be running it. And I've done that twice now and I'll do it a third time. That's where we, I come from on this. And I've got a great team of people I've worked with over the years who are also technically very good, but also entrepreneurial. We, we know how to make decisions. We know how to take things forward. And we know too when our time is up and the shareholders can carry on. It's cut and dried, Neil. I appreciate that. And stick with us. Uh, it'd be a great uh, pleasure to follow you guys and watch your actions over the next few years on this uh, current company. Well, wrapping up, Neil, you've been in this business a long time, as we've discussed. You've been one of the more successful company builders. What wisdom can you offer other CEOs who might be listening? And also, what wisdom do you offer for investors who are allocating capital to this sector? Oh, gosh. Um, I hate to offer my, my colleagues wisdom, um, presumptuous. All, all, all I can say is that believe in yourself, believe in the people, and if you don't do it, you miss the opportunity. And if you get it 85, 90% right, you can take care of the rest of it. And people spend too long trying to get 90, 100% right. So get on with it. Uh, just do it. Investors, I, I think you, if you look at an asset that's reasonable, the thing that makes the difference between the reasonable and turning a good asset is the management and their commitment and their dedication. That They're alongside you in many ways. They've done it before. They know what they're doing. They know why they're doing it. Those are the management people to support. And, and if they've got reasonable assets, they'll, they'll get the value out of them. If, if a bad team has a good asset, it'll get less value out of it. So I think you should look at the team, the experience and how they work together and how they are committed to it. I appreciate that. And management is king, in my view, Neil, and I think you would agree. For potential investors who are on the sidelines listening, market cap of Eris is uh, about 330 million Canadian here. What would you say to them about taking a stake in Eris at these current levels? Oh, I, I think if, if you look at the history of the company and the fact that it, it hasn't been pushed in the market in terms of presented because it was under something else. It was always the thing. It was always the second mine because Segovia, they, they did a great job on Segovia. Then they were turning their attention to Amato. And as I say, they were getting it ready to go. It is ready to go now. It is financed. So we're going to see value changes because of that. We're going to see value changes, I hope, and I don't know, but I hope with the drill results as well. And we'll see value changes through the M&A side. So we're beginning that climb now. So now is the time. And Neil, the best way for investors to reach out to the company? Website, phone me, contact me, email me. We're all first initial N Woodyer at arisgold.com. It gets me in five seconds. Quite happy to speak to anybody who wants to speak to us and explain to you what we're doing and why we're doing it and you know how we're going. The website gives a lot of information, but direct calls, nothing wrong with those. Neil, look, it's been a pleasure. Uh, good luck. Let's chat again sometime. I appreciate you taking the time. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to your listeners. I really do. Thank you very much. Cheers, Seth.